Welcome back to another episode of the Mac Rumor Show. I am Dan. We have Hartley here. Hartley, how are you doing, man? Good morning. Good. Good, after- good. good afternoon. Good afternoon for you. Afternoon now, yeah. Afternoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. let's jump into the news. We're going to waste no time. Um, the first thing that's super interesting. So Apple is planning to expand the AirTag like unwanted tracking alerts. So, you know, you get those alerts when... Uh, you notice that an air tag is found moving with you if somebody is trying to maliciously place one with you and follow you for some reason uh, you get an alert on your phone and that's really cool but like not everyone uses an air tag and so uh, apple and google has actually like together come together to propose an industry specific or an industry specification to kind of help you know combat that and more and more third party devices can uh, actually adopt that into its platform and be able to kind of offer the same security feature. So what do you think about that? That's actually pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's that makes perfect sense. There's been a little controversy over the last year about uh, tracking alerts and unwanted tracking alerts. Apple released an app for Android um, so that Android users could detect if an AirTag was moving near them. But that obviously is a little bit of a, uh, a, a not ideal solution right? because um, it's relying on every Android user remembering to install that app. And set it up properly. So some sort of um, built-in feature across iOS and Android that can detect any item tracker using this standard uh, makes perfect sense. Um, yeah. So it's a little bit uh, like the uh, the smart home standard matter, uh, yeah. where Apple, Google, and Amazon will work together to create this standard protocol. So it's it's really good to see that. Do you think this is going to lead to a lot more chaos, though? Because remember when this first all started happening and the alerts and the tracking and stuff, there was a lot of chaos of like, I still get random alerts, too, on my iPhone. That's like, there's a tag, unwanted air tag moving with you, but it's literally my air tag. So imagine opening this up to a bunch of other devices and platforms. And it's just, to me, I'm seeing the, the negative side of it. I mean, I see the positive side, but I'm also looking at the, the negatives there. My concern is about family sharing or when you're just with friends. Um, so what if you're on a, on even if families may be more understandable because if you have family sharing enabled, maybe those devices um, don't trigger alerts. But what if your, uh, maybe your friend has an Android device, which now can detect a moving um, air tag with this new protocol, supposedly, and you're on a road trip and uh, it, yep. you're just getting that alert the whole journey. It's 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 a it's a little bit of a, a problem and a question, and it 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 will be interesting to see if they do eventually, probably not until quite some later stage, build in some feature where you can say no, this is the this device does belong to someone I know, so don't keep telling me about that. I mean, that would make the most sense, like if you already determined, like okay, now this is mine or it's a friend's or whatever, like. Yeah, you should just be able to to tap that and like know that that's you know an option and kind of designate that. I, I don't know why we don't have. Maybe that'll come in iOS 17. Who knows? You know, it could be one of those little quality well, yeah, of life we, we are little features. Find my features. We are expecting a load yeah. more. That's what Mark Gaiman said to us. So uh, that could be in the sphere of sort of location related features. And with regards to family and friends, he also did mention that Apple is thinking a little bit more about changing find my to be a little bit more like a social network or at least um, have more social functionality within find my so maybe that is kind of in the right area of designating family and friends that maybe would not trigger certain air tag alerts yeah i think that makes the most sense um i don't that's intriguing so like a little social network of find my so like when you're around other random people like does it give you that's kind of that could be kind of creepy too for some people. Well, the the journaling app, or I think it's the the rumored journaling app, is supposed yeah. to integrate with Find My and tell you about your physical proximity to other people throughout the day. Which, I mean, I, maybe that's, that's interesting. Yeah, but it's a bit strange, isn't it? That's what I was thinking of. Like, that seems weird. Like, imagine being out at a at a bar or a restaurant and you see somebody. Maybe you make eye contact. I could just see a bunch of people go into their phones being like, okay, was I in the close proximity to this person? Do I need to let, and then, I, I don't know. Hopefully you can't like physically contact them in some way, but I don't know. No, I think it would just tell you like you were within one meter of 10 different people today. 
but I, I don't know why I really want to know that. Um, I mean, it could be cool to like discuss. Yeah, maybe, maybe people can allow different permissions, kind of like AirDrop. Like, oh, hey, I'm allowing you to see my name in a profile picture that I set up. Uh, and then if you really want to get crazy, here's my name and you can message me. You don't see my number, but you can message me or something like that. That is actually pretty interesting for meeting new people, you know? Um, I well, don't know. That could be kind of creepy. <laughs> um, Apple does have this ecosystem advantage. And it's interesting that they haven't leaned more into that social media angle. Because if you were to integrate existing apps and services, so you think of Find My, uh, iMessage, and contacts, and if that could all kind of work together um, more cohesively where you actually have a profile, maybe a little bit more like WhatsApp, um, and Apple did make some of these changes with allowing you to set a profile picture that you can share, but what if you actually have a, an online profile? Um, that would be yeah. moving more in that direction that would be interesting, and then I can actually give someone a URL to visit my profile, and then I can say what permissions I want to give them. For that i think that's maybe the long-term direction here apple is perhaps not actively working on a social media network as such but maybe it's just kind of a, a sleeper underneath everything else in the ecosystem that will gradually get a little bit richer especially maybe with facetime on the headset as well um, especially if that really makes a big push into memojis which have been a, a fun gimmick but haven't really done very much if the headset really does go for virtual avatars as well you can see how this does seem to be an ecosystem advantage. Hey guys, I just wanted to take a quick break to let you know that this episode of The Mac Rumor Show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. You've heard me talk about how important it is to have a VPN to protect your online privacy, but choosing a VPN you trust is equally as important. Now, I like to do research on my sponsors, and I only recommend brands to my listeners that I believe in, and I've used ExpressVPN in the past, so I can say with full confidence that ExpressVPN is the best VPN on the market, and here's why. Number one, ExpressVPN doesn't log your activity online. Lots of cheap for free VPNs make money by selling your data to advertisers, but ExpressVPN doesn't do this. So you can ensure all of your internet history and data isn't being sold off to other companies. And so everything is on a trusted server. And so it's stored properly and safely. And then the next thing is just speed. Um, I cannot recommend ExpressVPN enough. Uh, it's super fast. It works across all of my devices, and I'm able to have blazing fast uh, internet connections and watch videos in full HD, no buffering. You basically don't even know that you have a VPN on. With some of the other VPNs out there, it clogs up your connection, slows everything down. You don't need to worry about that with ExpressVPN. And then one of the last things, of course, is just how easy it is to use. Um, it's safe. It's simple. You just download the app. You open it up, and and there's just one tap to get it running. That's it, or one click, depending on what device you're using it, because it works across all devices and platforms, so you don't have to worry about, oh, is it gonna work on my iPhone, my Mac, my iPad, whatever the case may be, it will work. So to protect yourself with the VPN that I use and trust, use my link, expressvpn.com slash Mac, today to get an extra three months for free on a one-year package. So that's expressvpn.com slash Mac. Visit expressvpn.com slash Mac to learn more. So last week we talked about, uh, you know, some added updates to the health app. I think there's, you know, you mentioned that journaling app and then what the mood app that would be coming in 2024. But uh, we didn't talk about like actual redesigns that are going to happen to the health app, but also to the wallet app, which I also saw some information and I'm not sure maybe you can back it up. Um, I was on vacation last week, so my my news reading was a little like, oh, just a quick glance, whatever I can get in. Uh, did I see that Apple is finally um, expanding more states? Or I guess it's not really Apple's thing. It's more of the states that are in the US going to adopt the IDs. I saw Ohio was on this list. Please tell me that list is real. First off, that's my first question for that. Well, I, I'm not. A, I'm not a hundred percent sure about that, um, but ah. it is growing. It is. It is. Okay. Uh, it is a feature that is expanding. I mean, eventually, you hope it will come to every state and it will expand. I hope, at least internationally. Well, so I think it was from the source that's uh, that's claimed in the article that we're talking about from Analyst Nine Four One. I believe. I believe that was a Twitter account that I saw the tweet from on the on the growing list of states that are going to adopt here in the US. How, how is it for you guys? Is this feature available in the UK? 
Nope. Yep. See, no, that's it still is, you know, just reserved to some U.S. states. Um, yeah. But it was like two it, states here, like Arizona yeah. and Washington, I think. But it, it'll get there eventually. Um, okay. It seems like I think we're a lot more likely to see this sort of feature expand internationally than stuff like Apple Pay Cash um, and financial services. So the mock-up that uh, this user had was actually really cool. So, uh, you know, there's some icons along the bottom now in this in the wallet app. The wallet app has potential to be like an incredible, incredibly useful app that it already is in that regard. But like getting our wallet, getting the keys, m making these things that we use in our everyday life where we have to carry around a physical wallet if we can eventually completely eliminate that, and I know that's the goal, but like right now here in the U.S., it's still something that we do need to carry, but we're close. And so I'm hoping that this redesign helps get third-party people involved and uh, Apple and other services out there really start to you know expand that. But So you have cash at the bottom, so all of your debit, credit card, savings account now, um, you get... Uh, your cards, so your cash. So I don't, I don't understand this. So he has cards and cash, kind of well, separated. Maybe Apple Pay cash. Yeah, I believe that. I felt like that could have been because it's a card. You know, it's still not physical. Right. I feel like you could just put that under cards, but whatever. So cards, cash, keys, IDs, and your orders. Which orders, by the way, that could be really useful if that kind of just gets yeah. boosted a little it hasn't bit more. Been widely enough adopted, but it is yeah. also a little bit buried. And yeah, it's um, hidden. So maybe putting it a little bit more front and center yeah. will enable that to, or at least will encourage um, vendors to put that. Is it just uh, an API for tracking? Like, how does it work? Probably. I'm I'm not sure, but I, I have not had a single delivery that uses it. I have had, uh, I'm actually going to look this up, and I'm going to try to talk at the same time. I have had one very specific thing that I see every so often pop up. Um, for delivery. So it is like it's a tab at the top right. So I've had five things, six things. Uh, and it's for, <laughs> this is ridiculous. So when I'm at the Browns games, uh, you know, here in the NFL, you get 50-50 uh, like raffle tickets that they sell and you can do it through the app. And for some reason, I get those delivered. They say they're shipped. It's just a digital <laughs> number. So that was in, De in November. Uh, in December, I had some vinyl records that showed up uh, and this like random coffee. Yeah, so it seems to be a lot of like records shops that I get have been using that. That's it. And and then the digital 50-50 tickets that I ordered were delivered in that. Um, so you're right. It is just random things. I know a couple of apps that I've used, um, maybe after ship, it like kind of reads your, I mean, I don't know how much of it it's reading, but it's reading your emails for uh, you know, things that come in that have a tracking link. Maybe if Apple can figure out a way to non-invasively do that. I mean, we're already giving permissions to these apps. So if people are cool with it, then like let it attach to your Amazon account and your Best Buy account or whatever the case Amazon may be. Amazon would be a, a big game changer. Big one because that's where a lot of deliveries. And, and then if it could tie into FedEx and UPS because they have their own, um, you know, services that I use, maybe, I don't know, some way to make it way more useful. Um and again, one step in the right direction is moving that icon down to the bottom because it's definitely a little hidden if you're not looking for it. Um, yeah, the passes and more tabs, being able to add that in there to get those away from the cards. Yeah, I think it's a little overcrowded at the moment. It, I think that's yeah. that's a lot of the the problem is I don't want all of these like loyalty cards, debit cards, exactly. credit cards. But of course, when you actually go to use this stuff, you're in a hurry a lot of the time. You don't want to be digging through that list. So I think it's a, a really basic quality of life change. Um, so I'd be happy to see that. Um, and the health app is another one where I would really welcome some changes because I don't know about you, but I think the health app is structured pretty terribly as it is. So the way it works at the moment is you get all of your health data and you can select some favorites that you can kind of pin to the main screen. Um, those are displayed in a list view, and then you can tap through to see all of your health data, and that is organized by the, uh, the order in which it was last modified. But this is just really unhelpful. So if you add something like um, you track dietary information, where you're going to be adding metrics for 
a whole load of different um, things in your diet, yeah, you could add a hundred pieces of data at <laughs> once, which means if you want to just check your weight, which is not pinned as a favorite, you're going to yeah. have to scroll through a hundred things to get to that. So it's not really very intuitive. It's not very visual either. It's lots of numbers when actually you could use um, charts and graphs to convey some of this information in a bit more of a natural way. And I think maybe that's what this redesign is proposing, giving it a little bit more like the weather app with these individual squares and individual cards um, for showing different metrics. Yeah. I mean, just looking at, again, you know, go over to macrumors.com. There is an article in the last couple of days, or you can check out Analyst941 on Twitter um, who had a lot of these claims. And there's some redesigns that go along with it, or some concept designs um, or mock-ups based off of what the, the information is. And I like the, like, tile-esque view of the favorites in this mock-up here. Um, I think that's a really good step in the right direction um, I would also like to see like better integration with your like healthcare provider. I know there are um, ways to link that. Like here for the Cleveland Clinic, we have my chart and that links in, but like it's kind of a mess. And so being able to like pin some of those things, like getting your doctor messages somehow to be able to go into that, and your medications are all nicely listed. And I don't think it ties into medications very well. It, that would be another useful tip. Like if you're prescribed a medication, like it should just automatically import that some way, somehow. Um, so then you're like, okay, I'm starting this. It's 10 days. Like it says so on here. Read those, you know, things and automatically set that up for me so I don't forget if I'm taking an antibiotic or something. Um, I don't know. Yeah, but I like where we're headed because the health app is an insane mess right now. I was just looking at it while you were talking at, about it and I'm like, this is horrible. You're scrolling for days. It's just it's just information overwhelm. It is a little bit like yeah. the wallet app in that sense. Mm -hmm. It's just too much on each screen and it's not relevant enough to what I want to see right now. I think the health app will get there with time. Apple has enough of a focus on health and fitness, particularly since uh, the Apple Watch enabled uh, or at least provided Apple with so much more cause to actually uh, give users a good visual presentation of this data. It will come, especially as the Apple Watch tracks more data. And Apple wants to be, um, if not a full-blown healthcare provider, it wants to provide digital systems for healthcare. So things like messaging your doctor, uh, more direct integration with medication, of course, we did see last year, but even deeper, as you're suggesting, um, I think that will all come. Uh, just it will, it will take a little while. Yeah, so those two apps will be getting some big updates. And, uh, you know, I'm just... I'm just excited for WWDC and to see all of these these things um, and test out the new betas. But real quick, back to the wallet. What what do you need to be completely walletless? Uh, well, I don't have a smart lock, so I would need okay. to get that. I would also need to have a car that supports keyless entry. Okay. Um, and uh, some sort of digital entry. Um, that, that's not that's not too tricky. There's quite a lot of vehicles that have that available now. Smart locks are easy enough, so those things are quite easy. Um, I would really like my driving license to be yeah. digital. That is a big one. Um, to not because otherwise you always feel like you've got to carry around some form of photo ID. Yeah. So there's still there's still enough of the way to go um, for me. And I always. I don't know what it's like in the US, um, but I always get concerned about contactless limits or I feel like I want to have the reassurance of having a physical card on me. Wait, you um, have contact payment limits? Yeah, but they they vary depending on the... Uh, like limits and the, how many times you can use it or like the money amount? On the, on the amount. And they, they are much higher now than they used to be. When it first came out, they were maybe like 15 pounds per transaction, which is obviously stupidly okay. low. But now they yeah. now they're pretty much unlimited, but some aren't. So regardless of those limits, I always kind of just feel like I want to have a physical card with me just for reassurance. Yeah, um, I'm so, trying to think if I've made a huge payment over like a thousand plus uh, using Apple Pay at a physical store. And I want to say I have. I think I have at an Apple store. I was going to say, but does the Apple store count? Yeah. Uh, I feel like I've done it at Best Buy too, but I don't know. Yeah, it's tough. I've never seen a limit though, and we've definitely, we've definitely had some bigger purchases too. But just you know, maybe not 
a couple thousand dollars at a time. But um, do you have any, have you run into any places in the UK where they don't accept contactless payments? Now, no. Uh, I actually think that as far as I understand, contactless adoption is way better in Europe than in oh, the yeah. US. Yes. It, well, um, I, I, the US is getting better. Um, I would say like maybe as of like two years ago or even up until last year, I could point out a bunch of places that just don't take it. And it is very frustrating. But now a lot of the gas station pumps are starting to take. So if you don't want to go inside, um, you know, you can tap to pay. Most gas stations um, are doing that. Uh, Walmart and Kroger are some big like grocery retail stores that just are trying to do their own thing. I think Kroger is now officially moving over into like tap to pay that's not Kroger pay and Walmart pay is a huge failure and I don't understand why they haven't seen the error in their own ways and you know change over as well um there are many reasons why I don't prefer to go to Walmart but I think that's one of the biggest ones is that I just don't I, I'm trying so hard to just not have to carry my wallet with me my car is fine my home we use the garage is attached to our you know, in the U.S., that's probably pretty common to where you don't really need a front door key if you have a house for the most part. Um, but even if I did, our front door key does have the, although I'm not going to tell you the brand, but it's just, it's not working out. It works so well. It was like a horrible install. Um, and then it worked. And then when it, when I finally got it to work, it was flawless. And now all of a sudden, it's just like all of the smart features have stopped. Uh, and so I, that is the concern with smart locks. I, I yeah. feel like, um, if I was to install one, I would still want an additional physical lock so I could use the, the key. smart lock. If I was, uh, yeah, the smart key, if I was just coming and going, um, yeah. you know, if I was only going out five or 10 minutes and I was confident, but if I was going out for the full day, I would want to use a physical key. Um, I just, I don't, I don't have enough faith in them as it stands um and maybe this is because it still is quite a new technology we, we we've all seen the videos where someone comes up to it and just like just uh just like pops the back off takes a battery out and can just unlock the door and i know that isn't so common now and each year they are getting better um and they are getting more tamper proof i mean when they first came out i remember that people could do things like shout um for siri through your letterbox um mm. and then ask ask him to unlock your door and it would do oh yeah yeah so now, now you, yeah, you're a you bit can't beyond do that. that but it's still kind of a little bit concerning to me i don't know if so, i fully trust it yet. so i will say that i've used smart locks for the last like five years in a couple of different houses um, most of them have worked in the sense of like at the very least i still don't i've never used a key on on any of these locks um but because in some way they all have multiple backup fail safe ways like, you know, if, if the home key isn't working and that's, you know, with this lock that I was talking about, home key just stopped working and then like the auto lock stopped working. And I think there's something going on that I might need to repair and I've just been too lazy. Also, I, I just received, I don't think, I think it's still under embargo, so I can't say what it is, but it has home key and a keypad, which is where I was going with this is that most of the time, the other locks that I've had that had some sort of smart way to get in have had a keypad and we just use that because it's so convenient. Um, and so that's what this other lock needed was that it needed a keypad or some easier way to get in. Uh, but yeah, that I, I'm pretty good there. Um, my car is good. Like I said, I, I, I think Apple Pay is good to the, for the most part. There are some places that you will need a card. Um, a lot of restaurants too, that was kind of the holdup too. If you go to a restaurant, you still give them your card, but like right. a lot of them come around with, you know, the little machine and you just tap to pay that way. Um, so I think once we're fully there, I just need the wallet. I think I just need my license and I'm good for the most part, but yeah, I mean the, the MagSafe wallet definitely is not enough of a, a convenient solution for me, at least. I think it's a good interim thing. If you don't want to carry around a full bulky wallet, it kind of makes me feel like I'm not carrying a wallet and physical cards, even though I am. But uh, it, is, it is not Apple's best product, I have to say. No, I don't like it, but I use it. Is that right? <laughs> this is what I use? Yeah, yeah I, I don't like it, but I use it. Yeah, and one of them is occupied by my license. One of them is occupied by my Tesla key, so that just in case... 
something happens, phone dies or whatever, I do have a backup. It's not necessary, I think, for day-to-day use, but uh, definitely if I was going on a trip or something or somewhere long-term, I would want a backup. Um, and then the other is just a debit card, which I should probably just move strictly over to the uh, Apple card. I do that for trips. Like when we go on a trip, we just use our credit card for everything and then pay it off. But for like day-to-day use, I just like to have a debit card there. Uh, I know a lot of finance people are yelling at me that you should never use a debit card for anything, but I don't know. This, uh, this is the finance podcast. What's that? That's not a finance podcast, so forget. So forget it. I'm not listening to your your, your advice, even though it might be correct. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to see those updates. Uh, speaking of updates and things that I was looking forward to, uh, the Apple Watch Ultra. Micro LED display is now going to be pushed to the second half of 2025. It's not like it was coming up anytime soon, but now it's really not getting a huge Quite update. Quite a long wait. Yeah. Quite a long wait for something substantial with the Apple Watch Ultra. So you think um, these next two years are going to be pretty... Or, or do you think that's going to have an update at all in the next two years? Uh, I, I think it definitely will have an update. Um, I think it will be update. I, I've disagreed with a lot of people about this. Some people seem convinced that it is a completely separate product line and will not be updated on the same line as the other, uh, along the same timeline as the other Apple Watch models. I think that's nonsense because there's no way that the Apple Watch Series 9 gets a chip bump, but the Apple Watch Ultra doesn't when that is the high end device that is twice the price. True. Um, so they are definitely going to be updated together as far as I see. Maybe I'll be wrong about that. Maybe I shouldn't throw the word definitely around. Um, but the question for me is, this means that the Apple Watch Ultra, as far as we know, it, well, it's not rumored to have any major hardware upgrades for three years now, over a three-year period. So other than maybe the chip this year, color. What, yeah, um, maybe some sort of color option. That would be very Apple if they can't deliver a, anything new for hardware. Just give us a color option. I know a lot of people uh, wanted a darker a darker version. So I, I can, can completely see. see them doing that when they've exhausted what they can do in terms of hardware. Um, maybe next year will be the year we finally get some, some sort of new health feature. Um, I don't know if the... Uh, the blood glucose sensor will be ready for next year. I think it possibly is still a little bit soon. I can't quite remember exactly what Mark Gurman said about that, but 2024 does feel a little bit too early, especially if that's got to go through a lot of regulatory hurdles. So what is going to happen with the Apple Watch Ultra over the next, over the three generations before we get to that? I'm guessing one of the other features will be a custom action key, which is ridiculous because they should just be able to do that across all uh do you, do you think that would be something that they could they would do? Now that I'm thinking about it out loud, it's like you can't you can't make the next year's version. Let's say this year they come up with another color chip bump, and then they're like, oh yeah, this year the, the action key is customizable, but that's purely software based. So and they don't bring it to the other op, to the other Apple Watch. What do you mean? What do you mean by action key? Like it's customizable for any app. You can have it do anything. Isn't it at the moment? I don't have an Apple Watch Ultra. So I don't unless know, that's unless that's you, changed and I missed it, but no, no, it's only limited to. Uh, but can't you run shortcuts which enable you to do? That's not the same. That's want. not the same. That's not the same because it, so it doesn't so it doesn't work as well. Like like I, I could literally map it to open up any app, any function that is within you know. If I wanted to do a quick blood glucose uh, check, I hit the button and it automatically does it. Now I know you like you said you could probably set up a shortcut for that. But yeah. it's not it's not as that's not as user friendly as just in baked into the OS. Like that right. to me now actually the way I think of it should be a watch OS ten update for the Apple Watch users. But yeah, now, I don't know. Hasn't Apple done something like that where it's kind of a software related feature that's strictly for a high end phone that just kind of gets tossed into the next year? But they've never not updated like the the the, the lower devices that are still in that. Like they've never is there a, an iPhone 14 Pro feature that's the same as the 13? I guess always on display. Yeah, um, some of the, the hardware is there, right, for the 13? Uh, or is it the LTPO what, goes what lower? Standard, yeah, it's because you need ProMotion. But that. That wasn't on the thir- that was on the thirteen. Not on the standard thirteen. No, not the standard. The pros. Y- yeah. So the standard. I've 
Did it not have always on? No, it didn't. Did no, it? No. So no, no. So that's what I'm saying. Like always on display. Oh, because it it's because the refresh rate went the refresh even rate. lower. Yeah, that's what I was. But but like still, you could still offer like some sort of always on. Maybe it doesn't work exactly right. the same way. But they just decided no. Apple wants you to buy the new one. That's, right. So that's, that's what I'm saying. Cool. Do you think they could do that with the action button where it's like, oh, but if you really want action button to be customized. Oh, oh they absolutely could do that. I mean, okay. I, there have been so many examples of this over the years. Like one of my um, favorite ones is live photos. So that was exclusive to the Come iPhone on. 6S. I don't remember this. <laughs> oh, no, but no. I remember it because it was just no. so stupid. Oh, Live photos were exclusive to the iPhone 6S, was a big selling point for the iPhone 6S. But that is purely a software feature. Oh, it yeah. Is entirely it, a software feature. Hot take. Don't love that feature, by the way. Um, I quite like it. I quite like it. But it was stupid at the time. Um, and it did make me want to buy an iPhone 6S. So I felt like they got what they wanted. Um, and it, it even does it with things like um, Smart HDR. There's no reason why, when they bring out a new version of Smart HDR, that that version of Smart HDR okay. can't, can't so, be So device. it doesn't sound as stupid then as I was originally thinking as I fleshed no, the I, it idea. No, it took me a second to kind of get my get my head around what you were saying. But yeah, I completely get yeah, it. Like it's not fully cut. You can argue the shortcuts thing, but like not everyone knows what a shortcut is uh, that, that's potentially buying this watch. Uh, not everyone wants to to make the time. Even us people who you know live in this world and breathe every day and do it. Like I'm not making a lot of shortcuts. I know you might, but I'm not. And I think there are a lot of others that are like I just don't want to spend the time to do that. It should be just something that I can click this button and it gives me, or within the settings app or something, I can easily customize any function that's already there. And third party apps well, can take advantage of that. Functions, um, yeah, would be good to see. Um, or even if it's suggested shortcut actions, because what I will say is that shortcuts on the watch does not work very well at all. And you can set up a shortcut that theoretically works on the watch, but then it, you'd actually go and try it and it just doesn't. And it's not that it, it lacks a technical capability. It just is buggy and doesn't work. So I'll give you an example. I've set up shortcuts where you can change the uh, start or end time of a calendar event. And that should work on Apple Watch. It did a few years ago or a year ago. It doesn't work anymore. It just doesn't. It just refuses to. to yeah. So the shortcut completes. Um, it tells you that it's run, but it doesn't actually change the event time because shortcuts on the watch has been forgotten about. People think, oh, it's been forgotten about on the Mac. No, it's the watch that is actually the casualty. Um, people don't. Uh, remember the fact that Apple has just neglected adding actual watch-specific shortcut actions, which yeah. is a real shame because especially now you have that action button that provides really good use case. Um, I think that maybe they could go a little further in both regards, provide you with some presets, some more um, stock actions, but also actually make shortcuts work properly. Make like sure that if you present a shortcut it sh uh, for the watch, it actually does work. Yeah, and come up with some of those automations too, where you're, you know, you're, you're clicking on your, like you're ready to go for a run. You hit the side button, and it immediately you set up this function where it immediately starts your workout for that run that you, you know, whatever your workout that you wanted to do, and it immediately kicks on a podcast that you set or a playlist that you set, and you're just one tap and you're gone, and like that's all you have to do. Like I think so many people would eat that up. Um, because like, how many times are you sitting there like, all right, well, hit the workout button. All right, now I need to change the playlist. And it's like, you know, I don't know. It's just not ideal. There's so many things you can do with that button. And right now, I think it's pretty lame. <laughs> I, I know the shortcuts options there, but you just said it yourself. It doesn't work that well. And uh, the other four options that you get are not that great. So I think there are more than no, four. I agree. But... And I think that kind of relates to something that we'll talk about a little later, um, which is that Apple is still um, not been helpful enough in terms of making the watch faster to access the things that you actually want. And the action button could be very useful for that. And I'm sure in, for, for some people it, it is great, but it, it definitely should be able to do more in terms of taking you directly to where you need to go so that you're not holding your wrist up uncomfortably for 25 seconds before you find what you want. It's yeah. clearly not meant to be that sort of device. And that's kind of our main topic for today is watch OS in general. Like what do we remember about certain features that Apple has removed? Because there are rumors of some features that are kind of similar coming back. 
Um, and actually, we'll jump into that now. But part of that is widgets is going to be a central part of watchOS 10's interface, according to Mark Gurman. And that kind of sparks the whole glances thing, which honestly, up until we talked about this podcast and like fleshed it out, like I do not remember glances. Like looking back at it, because it was removed when? Like a few years after launch? Uh, it was watchOS 3. Yeah, I don't remember watchOS 3. So like... But, I mean, I really don't remember glances being a thing. And I'm looking at it being like, oh, that's cool. Like, that would be useful, like, if we had something like that. So, so now to you're explain get that what glances actually were, um, especially, you know, for new Apple Watch users that uh, you maybe have only used, a, what would it be, an Apple Watch Series 2 um, or newer, it was a UI feature where you swiped up to go to Control Center and you had these different sort of widget cards that you could scroll through horizontally, and you could set these in the watch app on your iPhone. So you could get a weather widget or um, a heart rate widget, and it would be a way that with just one swipe up, and then you just swipe across, you can quickly get access to this information. And then with watchOS 3, it was just replaced with the control center that we now have. Um, so I really liked it. Did you like it? Yeah, well, now that I'm like having fun, because I've just always thought of the control center which also i rarely ever use and uh some of those <laughs> things in control center could just be a glance uh you know that you can add to that little ui and so that's kind of the whole point of what basically it's coming back in widgets form correct yeah so i don't think it will be located in the same place or at least mark german didn't say that um he just seems to suggest that this is a whole new way of interacting with the device in a, in, 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 in a way that will almost parallel how apps are accessed at the moment. So it will be even more central. Um, it's just interesting to bear in mind that Apple did try this sort of thing with glances, and it looks like they're going for it again. And obviously, the expansion of widgets on its other devices clearly plays into that with iOS 14, um, the expansion of widgets on the iPad, and even the way that widgets are designed now on the Mac. Lock screen widgets always on display. Apple's gone all out with widgets, so you can completely see that the watch is the outlier now. Um, so they're going to have to make that, though. They're going to have to make it useful uh, in terms of, like, and, 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 and easy in terms of how you get to it. And so I'm trying to think. The only one that makes sense for me is to swipe from right to left. But doing that now switches your watch face. So I personally hate that. I don't usually switch my watch faces at all. And if I do, I don't mind taking the extra like second if we were to just long press. Like long press on it. That brings up your watch stuff anyways. Maybe we cycle through that way and make that the only way that you can cycle through. And then if you really want to make it a, a swipe, make it like... How, you know, if you want to get to the control center and the notifications when you're within an app, you kind of like press and hold and then swipe down in order to do that in certain apps? They should do it that way, like a press and hold from right to left. That'll help change your your watch faces. But I really do think it's got to be a quick swipe from right to left here with the widgets in order to make it something that everybody uses. Well, one thing that this report mentions that's really interesting um, and I'm really excited about this entire uh, proposition um, is because it seems to be suggested that this will be completely central. So it will be more important than apps. And what um, That's fine. Mark, Mark Gurman suggests is that when you click the digital crown in, instead of taking you to the home screen, it takes you to your widgets. Oh, okay. That's fine. So it's... Yeah. It's completely, it's it's overtaking the home screen, which I love because I, the, the big issue I have had with watchOS for years, as we said, um, as I said a little bit earlier, is that it just takes far too long to get to everything. The list of apps is way too long to scroll through. Everything is split down unnecessarily um, because they don't have tabs in individual apps. So instead you get three or four different apps. Um, say with Find My is what, three different apps for find items, find people and find uh, yeah. devices. So you've got this this stupidly long list of apps. And by the time I actually find what I'm looking for, I'm fed up of holding my wrist up because it just takes too long. Um, so, and also the the app screen, it looks really pretty. It's been unchanged since 2014 when the Apple Watch was announced. But if you have ever tried to organize your apps there 
or uh, try yeah. and organize things in any sort of logical way, you realize it looks good, but it is not practical, which is why a lot of people end up using the list view. So I think the whole way that apps have been conceived has not actually been very conducive to a device that is not actually meant to be used for more than five or 10 seconds at a time. So to have widgets that just give you very quick glances of information at the core of the experience, at the core of the UI, makes absolute perfect sense to me. So I was really pleased uh, when this report came out at the weekend. Do you think there will be a refreshed, because this is like supposed to be reminiscent of the Siri watch face, where you have those little cards that you cycle through that are suggested, which is actually pretty useful. Um, do you think there will be a way to add widgets to your watch face now that are in that same manner of that watch face from you know that was released back in what uh, watch OS four? So, if my understanding of what um, Mark has said is correct, this widgets view will be available as an overlay for watch faces. Okay. So I don't think it actually integrates into a watch face, but something that is very similar to that Siri watch face can kind of come in over your watch face. So maybe instead of, as it is at the moment, when you click the digital crown, um, you you kind of zoom, is it zoom out or zoom in in order to go to the home screen? Um, and the watch face kind of minimizes into that little round it's watch zoom out. app. Yeah. Um, but instead, if I'm understanding this correctly, it would be that the watch face is the very back of the UI. It is like that is the home screen now. It's not its own app. It is seen behind everything else mm. unless you're actually running an app. And then this widgets UI comes in over the top of it. So I like it. Um, and one thing that's also quite interesting about what Mark suggests here is that because this is such a radical change, because this is really moving away from apps on the Apple Watch in such a significant way, it will be optional because Apple's actually anticipating that a lot of people won't like it. So it will be a phased transition seemingly away from being an app-focused device, um, which I don't think is a bad thing. Uh, it just makes me wonder how will apps actually end up existing because they're not going to completely disappear. How will I open the Find My app? Where will that app be listed? Um, but maybe that will be what you get when you press the side button. I was going to say, um, do you think this view, whatever this one is, the recents apps, does that remain? The dock, yeah. Is that the dock, yeah. So maybe that becomes the list view of apps um, long term. Yeah. And maybe we just slim down what is actually available in terms of apps there. I would be quite happy with that. Especially if some of the other rumors we've heard, um, which I should stress, uh, Mark Gurman hasn't corroborated those, so we, we're not 100% sure, um, or at least we're not 100% sure of what Mark is saying either, but we're a lot more sure of uh, Mark because of his track record. Right. Um, that maybe we do get some sort of a little bit more of an iOS-like watch um, interface for apps where apps are kind of in a grid style so you can get more on the display at once and then therefore you don't need to scroll quite so much. Like so, a folder? Yeah, maybe. Um, you didn't want to say uh, that word, did you? Yeah, um, so something along those lines uh, from the side button. I think the, these would be transformative changes for watchOS. I would be really excited about this because it addresses my single concern about um, the Apple Watch. And I think that with how well widgets have been executed, I know you can complain to me about interactive widgets, but I think that they clearly, they're, they're, they are beautifully designed. The watch, um, the, uh, the complications, the home screen widgets, the lock screen widgets, they are all beautifully designed. So to have that sort of refreshed experience on the watch where it makes the most sense to just have a quick glance at the weather app. I don't need a weather app on the watch. I just need a quick glance at what the weather is right now. Perfect sense. Really happy about it. Interactive widgets. I've been campaigning for it so much that I like I, it pains for me to say this part, but I don't know that I would want that on the watch. Just because of how many accidental presses that could happen, you know, that might make me a little nervous. Um, well, it might make more sense on the watch, to be fair. So and that's the, the thing. So, like, I, I don't know if I'm as, like little packaged apps so if the yeah. if it's no longer a weather app but a wet an interactive weather widget that looks very similar to the weather app yeah. where you can say in the current ui you tap and you go from precipitation to temperature to just a general forecast 
Yeah. That's fine. It's just a one tap interaction. That could work. That's fine. I, I, I that's why I don't want to speak in absolutes. I need to see what they would be, you know, cuz I'm not saying it wouldn't work, but I'd just be nervous if like I made a custom widget with some home stuff and uh, you know, I'm I'm all of a sudden unlocking all sorts of things <laughs> with my watch on accident. But again, if it's not living on your watch face, it's probably less likely. It's something that you would need to go into. Um, yeah, I could I could see that. I mean, they're probably they're, 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 leave it to Apple to give us interactive widgets on the watch and then on nothing else. That would be that would that, that, that's what would happen. They would just not put yeah. it on anything else, just the watch. Um, so I mean, yeah, I mean that's kind of our main topic, which we, you know it's we're not spending too much time on today. But uh, is there I don't know. Is there anything else that you would prefer when it comes to making the watch face and widgets and just watch OS in general just a lot better? Well, this would be my big thing. Um, the, yeah, what, I mean, that's the thing. This, this, is, this is exactly what I want, so exactly what I wanted to see um, that it's hard for me to really say much beyond that. But I would be interested to know what you think in terms of moving away from apps on the Apple Watch. So would you feel comfortable with that? Just kind of, yeah. I don't think they're going to go that far, but if they yeah. were to just phase apps out, would that be okay with you? Sure. I'm a huge fan of change. <laughs> I like to change things. Uh, you know, major life changes are always fun for me. I don't know why. It just spices things up. And so they could come out with a completely new operating system and I'd probably be happy just because it's something new. Um, so yeah, I'm totally fine with that. Uh, ask me again after that does happen, and then right. I'm like, God, I well, can't find what I'm look. I can't find what I'm looking way. for. Yeah, I don't know that there's anything here that I see. My watch is primarily used for you know glancing at information quickly, notifications that come in, um, and then you know tracking any activity that I do. So um, I don't really think that I use this for anything else to where like if things were moved I would be super upset about um, and I'm all for improvements and finding things faster is really the biggest thing like you said because um, when just I am actually yeah 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 I do like a lot of like like the pixel watch is kind of like a glance machine a lot of those third you know Google Wear or Wear OS whatever they call it a lot of those other platforms are very heavily invested in just scrolling on the crown or swiping through just different pages of things. And whether you like that or not, it is sometimes easier when you customize it the way you want it faster to find things. And so um, that's interesting. So I've not used any of those sorts of devices, uh, certainly no Wear OS devices. Was your experience better using those? Um, did you prefer that to how things are executed on the Apple Watch just in terms of how fast it is to get to things? It's better in some ways. It has its ups and downs, honestly. Uh, but also, those were circular watches too, so they were different form factor, different ways of portraying that information and having things laid out on the screen. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I I don't know that it's better, but it's different in some ways that it, it does make things a little bit faster, um, and in some cases, it does make some things worse. So, um, it's hard to me. It's been so long now since I've used one. Uh, at least the last six months. Um, well, it would be an interesting comparison when we actually do get Watch OS 10 to see yeah. how this new UI stands up to Wear OS and if there are actually any similarities that Apple has uncharacteristically pulled from the other side. Um, because if it is such a total change, that would be something I would like to like to see. What about the buttons? How do you feel about the buttons? Not Apple Watch Ultra button, like the just standard crown and side button. Do you think we need some changes for those? Yes, definitely. Um, that's why I'm excited by this rumor as well. Um, so that would that would change the crown. What about the side button? What would you like to see that do? Uh, well, I think it makes sense for it to go to the app view, um, okay. particularly if it's a grid of apps, because I like the dock. The dock has got a lot better, especially now the active app, so if you have a timer running, that is pinned to the top, um, which makes a lot of sense. But I just sort of forget that it's there, and I, I forget which apps I have in the dock. So if I want to say, say I wanted to use Find My on my watch, I would then think, is it in my dock or not? I don't remember. I'll just look through the app view. 
I'm not going to waste the time scrolling through the dock. And everything in the docks feels, I, I use a the smallest Apple Watch as well. So everything feels really crammed in there. The cards, they all feel like they're a little bit too close together to me on the smaller display. So I really like it in concept. I really like the idea that you've got a dock across all Apple devices for your most used apps. I think that intention is coming from a good place. But there's something about the execution of it that feels a little bit pointless to me because I feel like the actual app navigation system in the first place should be better to the extent that maybe the dock just lives at the top of the app list. Or if you're giving us a more iOS-like view, just let me pin four little tiny uh, circular watch apps to the bottom of the app view. And yeah. that's the dock in like a traditional Mac OS or iOS type way. I don't want it to be these massive floating cards where I can't even really see the whole list. I can only see two, maybe three things that is there at a time. Um, yeah. So yeah, do you I'm use the notification? Do you use the notification shade a lot? No, I, I don't feel like we can get rid of that. I feel like we can get rid of that. It's not reliable. Um, it's not. I don't and understand. This, this, this is the biggest issue. You know, we we've come back to this so many times. I think in every single one of our uh, our yeah. wish list podcasts, I think we've cheated. In, in every yeah. single one, we've said universal notifications. Yeah, um, it's just not. Reliable. It's true. It's true, um, and that's why the notifications I get on the watch are just not particularly helpful. And even with stuff like email, it won't actually tell me the contents of the email, or, or it will say it can't load it. Um, or the it, it, the emails come through in a massive stack all at once um, and don't trickle through in a, a natural way. Uh, so I don't find it very helpful. Um, I don't like to be too down on it because we do need notifications on the watch. It is a core part of the experience that if I don't quite lift my wrist up in time to catch something or I'm in a conversation, I don't want to lift my wrist up and then five minutes later I want to check. I do want to be able to see what that was, but... It's, it's, I think it's more of an issue with notifications across all of Apple's devices than it is an issue with notifications on the watch specifically, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. Is this just like a case of having too many platforms to, that it's just a problem to interact with each other? I feel like it shouldn't be. It's all from the same company, but it's just... This is, this is the issue is uh, sometimes Apple's ecosystem advantage is so good and so polished and so great but sometimes it can just be the most stupid thing. Yeah. Um, a bit, a little bit like with, say you're watching, uh, say you've caught up on an episode on something on Apple uh, TV in the TV app, and then later it'll tell you that that episode is now available. Why? It should know. Um, or if I've watched something on a different device, it should know why is it telling me on a different one? It's because it's not synced. Um, or you, you we, we've had it once or twice with this podcast where we stick something in Apple Notes on one device and then it is not synced across to another one. And that's yeah. just really basic sync. A third-party app would probably be okay with that. So maybe it's more of an iCloud and a sync issue than it is an ecosystem issue. Um, and iCloud's got a lot of layers at this point. It's got a lot of apps, a lot of services. It's a, you know a third-party app that is plugging into one um uh, a cloud provider for one single service and has one team of developers working on it can make that a lot more of a polished experience than old uh, Apple IDs that were created like 20 years ago with services that are not available anymore and all kinds of stuff uh, going on at the back end there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we can, we can do a whole podcast on notifications and sync and all that. So hopefully this year is the year um, and I hope that this is the year, I mean, it looks like it's shaping up to be the year where watch OS finally gets a pretty big, like, it's not like a afterthought cause it was for a couple of years there, right alongside TV OS and, and, yeah. uh, and whatever the home kit stuff was and all of that. Uh, you just really didn't talk about it a lot. You got a couple of things and you know, they talked about workout stuff and that's great, but you can't spend 10 minutes out of your 15 that you're devoting to watch OS just be, or five of your 10, you know, 50% of the, the keynote can't be uh, just, oh, we've added a couple of extra workouts and yeah. this is how we're going to track them. That's not good enough. And on the bright side, if they don't actually release universal notifications this year, which I don't think they will, at least we've got so. 
plenty of uh, podcast content for the next year until you know, next we could, year's WDC. We'll just make it the next 10, 50% of our podcast in the next year. Yeah. We're just going to be us complaining about, in some way, shape, or form, universal notifications. Yeah. That'll be our campaign. Yeah. Well, that's it for this episode. Um, be sure to subscribe if you've made it this far and you're not a subscriber or a follower of the podcast. And uh, yeah, Hartley, I will see you next week. Yes. Thank <laughs> you.